Hey guys, and welcome to another show and tell video. Uh, today, I'm gonna do California Collection Part Two. Uh, most of you watched Part One already. I showed you a lot of holsters and boxes. I'm gonna do a follow-up on that, but now I can start showing you some one-of-a-kind guns. Uh, that's right, my friend Peter had a lot of Walders. Um, not every gun I'm gonna show you today uh, was from his collection. Most of them were. A few other guns came in, and not everything he had was a Walder. He had some other guns. So I'm gonna show you a, a, an assortment uh, in part two and probably part three. Okay, so on part one, I showed you this box and I mentioned this PPK box has this abbreviation. I've never got such a response. I must've had two dozen people who told me that is abbreviation for extended. The word is verlängert, I hope, which means extended. So uh, Peter's note to me was that this this was for an extended magazine, and sure enough, uh, what I was able, this was an empty box, by the way, full disclosure, empty box, but I put it together with a beautiful PPK from Peter with the uh, Ferlengert um, magazine. Uh, so basically, we call that the box magazine, but this gun came from him. Um, this unnumbered box came from him and I just put them together and we will be offering this on our website. And speaking of my website, did you notice this? Remember this video? Uh, we just finally got that up on the website. That's models one through nine uh, and that's on our rotator. It just kind of goes through so you can check that out. Uh, that's all, and I did a whole separate video just on uh, that assortment. So again, speaking of one of kind things, uh, Peter had a good sense of humor. He would have loved my April Fool's joke, but unfortunately he missed it this year. Um, but I wanted to show you a couple things that are kind of an April Fool's joke I found at his house and I heard about these. First of all, he had this set of grips. Okay, anybody notice anything unusual? How about if you check it out, the Walder Banner is missing. Isn't that incredible? Yep, uh, this was made without a Walder Banner. I think Fritz had too many schnapps that day. Um, and he completely missed the banner. I, I actually am not sure how they could possibly do that because I would assume this was a mold and I've never seen another one like it. So there wasn't like a contract that never, that did, never had the banner. So how it came with no banner on either side, I can't explain, but leave it to Peter, leave it to Beaver to have one of these. Okay, uh, another uh, little joke uh, from the factory. Uh, check this out. Come on, look over my shoulder. Beautiful magazines, by the way, but look at the... Uh, banner logo. Gotta love it. Upside down. And he had not one, but two. I think I'll treasure these for a while. Okay, real quick, a couple of other, uh, what I think are one-of-a-kind guns. Uh, come, uh, come a little closer, check this out. Now on this one, um, it looks like a nickel finish, but actually, as I've examined it really closely, um, it's not for crump. It's not nickeled. This is bare metal. Um, you can see this has never been finished. This has never been finished. None of these parts have ever been finished. They're in the, in the white metal. And normally I'd say, oh, somebody just polished it off. But if you polished it off, you wouldn't see that crown end proof mark as distinctly as you do if it was polished off. You can see it's on an early serial range. So this was made in the uh, 1930s. So it's not like an end of the war unfinished gun. Um, this looks like it came from the factory, and here's the final clue. Uh, take a look at that logo. Now, that's acid etched. If you take off the finish, I, I, I know that you won't be able to see that logo, and certainly if you buff it after you take off the finish, you will not see that factory logo. So, I can't really explain it other than this gun. You can see the trigger guard, never finished, button, safety, never finished. Now, this is... Uh, this magazine is vercrompt, and you can see the finish underneath. So there's the bare finish underneath, but on this one, it just looks like polished metal um, that they put the logo over and then proof mark. So I can't really explain it. It's a one of a kind gun. I've never seen one like it. I, my first reaction was it's nickeled, but I don't believe it ever had a finish to it. All right, another gun that will rock your world. Um, actually, uh, so this is a gold engraved. You've seen these before on my site. Um, let's take a look at the other side. You can see it's an RZM and you can see the deep engraving gold, uh, gold overlay and under the gold is a nickel finish and that's 
typically what they did, they, they nickeled the gun and then they put a gold, a gold wash over it, usually very thin. You do see the Nazi eagle here. Uh, the serial number is just at the, well, it's at the end of the RZM range, but it's still within within uh, the RZM range, and the year would have been 1935, late 35 or 36, and sure enough, if you look at the front, you see the SA marking and 1936. Now this one I'm not offering for sale because I'm still trying to figure out who it might have gone to. Um, you can see here the Waller banner, gold wash, and the engraved bottom. Uh, white grips, by the way, and that's a one piece, there's no break here, one piece white grip, um, with the Nazi Eagle. Now, probably the most interesting part of this, if you look up, um, well, in the United States, we call it Victor Lutz. Um, we see VL. Uh, there's a PP. Here's a picture of it. It sold at Rock Island uh, uh, several years ago. I actually bid on it, but uh, I dropped out way before the, uh, the bidding ended. But that uh, VL was for Victor Lutz. And um, I believe from the spelling, German people will correct me, it could be Lutze, um, but in the United States, everybody calls him Victor Lutz. And, and if you look at his picture here, he was actually the successor of Ernst Rahm. So those of you who know the name Ernst Rahm, he was the head of the SA. Um, and he was in a rivalry with Heinrich Himmler. Uh, and you don't want to be in a rivalry with him because, in fact, on the night of the Long Knives, uh, with Hitler's permission, uh, the SS under Himmler... Uh, took out the command of the SA with uh, Ernst Rahm being offered the opportunity to shoot himself. Uh, my understanding is he did not shoot himself, and so they took care of it for him. But he was executed on the night of the Long Knives. Now, his successor then was Victor Lutz or Victor Lutze. That sounds Italian. Um, uh, and this may or may not be his gun, but it does have VL on it. And the PP that sold at Rock Island also had VL on it. Is it possible that he had more than one gun? It's highly probable that he had more than one gun. And, and because I believe a lot of the Nazi leaders, every time they visited a factory or did a favor for somebody, uh, we know from the history that they received bribes and, and you know, inducements. And certainly an engraved Walder uh, of this caliber would be something worthy of a man of his stature in, in Nazi Germany. Okay, Peter liked jokes, uh, but he also liked mystery guns. I can tell because this is a mystery gun. I'm going to show you why it is a mystery gun. Notice the box mag um, that comes with it. That's the black wartime box magazine in 22 caliber. This is a 22 caliber. Uh, we'll take a closer look in a minute. And um, But he liked these so much that he has one two, three, four, five of them. I'm going, to show, I'm going to show them all to you quickly, but he has five of these mystery guns. Let me show it to you. So this is a 22 caliber PPK. Uh, one of the reasons you can tell 22 caliber, the small caliber means that the, um, the slide is beveled down. Um, so you can see it's beveled right here. Um, makes the slide a little bit thinner than a typical PPK. If we look at the, uh, for example, the, the unfinished one, uh, you see there's no bevel on the slide and here it's beveled. So the 22 caliber, you can tell right away, it does have the thinner slide. Now, 430 serial number. So it's 430,000. The last three known serial numbers were 431096, 431097, and 431115. Um, I, Peter did have uh, the last one made. I'm trying to uh, get that to show you. Uh, but right now it's not in my possession. The last one made, I'm going to talk about that next. But so we know this was made at the very end, which is 1944. According to my records, the last PPKs were made in 1944. Yet this um, has the full logo and is a high polish finish. Uh, if you know the, um, the PPs, they went to an AC. There was no logo. They went to AC and they were dull finished by 1944. So this is a 22 in high polish finish, made right at the end. And not one, but he actually has five of them all in the same um, serial range. You can see there was a contract. Um, it looks like a couple hundred guns. So there's a contract of about 200 high polish, 22 caliber guns that are made right at the end of production. 
And why would that be? That would be the big mystery. Why were they making, I mean, they couldn't keep up with war production. Uh, the Army, uh, the, you know, all of the forces, the Luftwaffe, uh, the SS were all screaming for guns. There weren't enough to go around, and yet they took time to do a high polish finish, uh, 22 caliber. This one, you'll see, has a Waffen stamp. I believe that that is fake because all of the other ones, I don't know why they would put a Waffen stamp. All the other ones have the, oh, this has no, <laughs> this one has no proof mark, so it, it, was ne it never left the factory. This one also has no proof mark, so this one never left the factory. Two of these you can see are a little bit earlier, and they, de they, they are proof marked on the slide. On, on the 22s, it's proof marked up here, not down here like with most of the guns, but up here and on the ejection port and the end of the barrel. You can see these are also late war, but a, a lot earlier than the 430 range. And again, high polished 22 caliber. Uh, let's go back to the one that I believe is fake, what makes this one interesting. So somebody put a, um, a Waffen proof. It's possible that the military ordered some 22 calibers. Certainly the United States Army did um, target practice with 22. German Army and uh, police uh, used 22 calibers. I, I just don't believe that is correct. But also notice on the rear sight, it's an adjustable rear sight. See that adjustment right there? And it slides up and back, whereas these are all fixed sights. End of the war all had fixed sights. Check that out. And notice the front sight is a target sight. This was definitely made for target practice. Whether it went to the military, I don't know. If it was going to the military, why were they ordering it in high polish finish? Um, that makes this a mystery gun. And as I said, uh, Peter had five of them. All late war, all high polish, all in 22 caliber. The one thing I can say for sure this was a special order from somebody very important in the Nazi party because otherwise they would not have stopped production, changed the bluing salts out in order to make these guns in late 1944. Now that takes me to this gun, which according to three books, uh, probably all the books that you read starting off with Rankin's books on Walters, every book has this gun listed as the last PPK ever made in the Zellamelis factory. After that, the production went to France, the Manurin factory, and then it came back to West Germany, Ohm factory. Zellman, uh, I've said this before, but Zellamelis was in the Russian sector, so they had to get everything out uh, before the Russians were allowed to come in. Uh, they did uh, take a lot of the equipment and then blew up the factory. But I, I said that uh, several books have this listed as the last one made, but let's take a closer look. So here's what I uh, know about this gun. First of all, the, the serial number does not make sense. Every PPK, other than the W uh, series, which is much earlier, um, I think all the way back to 1938, every one of them ended with a K. This ends with an A. A was only used post-war. The serial number, as I, I already gave you, they all ended in uh, 431 and then uh, the rest, but this one is 433. Um, it's just too random. There are no other uh, guns in that serial range. This looks like it was not roll stamped. These were done very lightly. Well, you can see it better here. These are roll stamped. This looks like, this one looks like it was hand numbered. Uh, this is a Doral frame, not, never finished. It does have a uh, firing proof here, which again makes no sense. I basically don't believe it because these ones from 430 serial range have no proofs, meaning they never let the left the factory, but this one somehow, uh, even later, 433, was issued, firing proof, and if you look at this slide, there's something going on here. See the lines? They don't quite go to the top. Look at the two. The reason they, don't, they look beveled is because this somebody polished the heck out of this. Somebody polished the heck out of this. There's no logo, even though all of, all of the last ones known all have the logo. This one has no logo. This frame, you'll see that it is unrelieved. Now, let me explain that. Um, so at the end of the war, all of the PPKs had a relieved frame up until the very end, and you can see where this one is unrelieved. There's no, there's no indentation here. So we know this is a late war frame probably left over in the factory, probably put together after the war was over from parts. 
it was randomly numbered by hand of that Waffen stamp. I don't believe it. It's not facing the right direction and it does not look right to me. This side slide was heavily buffed and stuck on this frame. Also, the slides were all numbered here and this one is not numbered. All that is to say that this is a rare put together from parts, probably by the GIs, but I don't believe this was the last one made technically because it was not made by factory workers in the factory during the war. I think this happened after the war and it was put together from parts by who knows who. Now that still makes this a very valuable gun, in my opinion, but I don't believe this qualifies as the last one made, even though it is documented in three books as the last PPK ever made in Zellamelis. However, the parts were made in Zellamelis, although this is late war, this could be, this could be a, uh, much earlier. Uh, the magazine uh, is a wartime magazine no W on the back, but uh, actually the, the finish on the gun should more, look more like that than this high polish buff finish. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears a little bit, but also a one of a kind gun. Uh, this is obviously a broom handle Mauser, also known as a C96. Now C96 uh, designates that it was, the patent date was 1896. Um, and this was the first semi-automatic pistol. Um, all the repeating rounds before that were revolvers. This is the first semi-automatic pistol. And this was the first contract for the semi-automatic pistol. There's actually a date on it right here. I'll, I'll come in a little closer so you, so you can check it out. This number right here written in Farsi is 1898. So it's a Model 96. The order was given to Germany in 97 and these were produced in 1898. Uh, the Farsi is because that is the crest for the Sultan of Turkey. And he ordered 1,000 of these. You can see the three digit, they only made 1,000. So three digit is the full serial number and three digit here. Um, also un under here on the inside, you'll, you'll find the three digit Farsi number there. You can see the elevation markings for the adjustable site um, is written in Farsi. So this is a Turkish contract, again, the first military contract ever for the, um, the broom handle was the Turkish contract. You'll see the cone hammer. Uh, that's an er early feature. And it, it, uh, the ammunition is 7.63, so it's a, it's a very rare gun. I'm told that the uh, grips are numbered in Farsi on the inside, and I have to check that out. I haven't done that yet. Um, but this, this operates just like a, a regular broom handle but very, very early. Now, the Sultan of Turkey, uh, as I said, he, he ordered a thousand, but he, did, he put them in storage. When they arrived, he did not distribute them to his guards or his troops because it is said that he was afraid of a coup. That part of the world, there was a lot of coups and changing of governments. And so, in fact, he was worried about a coup, so he did not distribute these. He put them in storage for future use. He ended up, uh, they did bring in a new government. I'm not sure that if that was by coup. I, I doubt if they had an election. But a new government came in, allied with Germany, and uh, they entered World War I. And at that point, uh, these were distributed. A thousand of these were distributed to his troops. After World War I, these were pretty antiquated. Uh, so they were distributed all over the world, basically just sold off to governments who wanted them. And then very few of them came into the United States. Uh, this one came from somewhere, but is not import marked because it was made in 1898, which makes it an antique. So it was able to be imported with no import stamps. But this is a very rare, only a thousand made, very early Turkish contract C96. Okay, I'm going to show you another Walder because this is another one of a kind. There's a lot more Walders to show you. I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon. And then I'm going to show you a slotted Browning High Power because... Um, you've probably never seen one of those in the flesh. So I'm going to get one in the flesh and show it to you. But before I get to the browning, let me show you this gun. Okay, so as you can see, this is a 9mm PP. And you can see the quality of the finish. This is the way Peter liked his guns. I mean, everybody likes their guns like this. Just take a look at that. 9mm. So far, you're, you're thinking this is not one of a kind. Um, nine millimeters represent only about 1% of production, a little bit more than one, uh, about one and a half percent were nine millimeters. And then of course, uh, most were 7.65. Uh, this is 
you know, I, I, I would rate it 99% because maybe there's 1% wear right there and maybe there's 1% right there. I mean, this is just ridiculously beautiful, but that's not why I'm showing it to you. This just brings a smile to my face. I've never seen this before. Now, the nine millimeter we know has the bottom release magazine. Most of them are push button, but the nine millimeter, they found the frames were compromised a little bit. So they made them bottom release. And you can see right there, it says nine millimeter, bottom release magazine. It has a reinforced follower too. If you know Waller's, you can see that that's a reinforced follower because of the rounds were a little, a uh, little heavier load. But here's the piece that just uh, makes me smile. This has a lanyard loop, no big deal. Uh, a lot of times they were ordered with lanyard loops, usually by the police, although I see no police markings, but check this out. Never saw this before. Now, honestly, that was not done by Joe in his basement or Peter in his basement. Peter didn't have a basement, but that was not done by anybody. This has to be factory because check that out. It's not like cut out, it's molded in there. Never seen that before in my life. If anybody has ever seen a Walder PP or PPK with a lanyard where it fits into the, uh, into the grip. So this is one that I have to keep because I've never seen one like it. Uh, I don't think it adds a lot of value, but it's just extremely unique. Okay, are you getting excited yet? I told you I was gonna show you a slotted high power, but I lied. I have to show you another nine millimeter because, well, come here. This obviously is a nine millimeter and this is factory engraved. I'll get, you'll see that the, the uh, safety lever is engraved. Notice the pattern along here, the pattern here. There's the logo, nine millimeter again, very, very rare. And let's look on this side. It's crown end, so it's pre-war. There's the serial number. Kind of a uh, little bit of a floral pattern. Actually, this would be considered a floral pattern. When I showed you the kidnapping gun, I talked about English scroll. Uh, most of them were oak leaf and acorn. Uh, this, however, is a floral pattern. You can see the bottom of the magazine. Now, let's see how the magazine is marked. Yep, there, it's marked nine millimeter Walter Banner. Right side up, Fritz wasn't drinking that day. Sometimes the grip screws are even um, etched a little bit or engraved a little bit. In this case, they're not. I'm not sure if that's a replacement. It does look like it's original. But here's the reason I'm showing this to you. Didn't I just tell you that they didn't put the push button in the frame because it compromised the frame? This is, you know, if this is 1% one, 1 were nine millimeter, only 1% of the nine millimeters had a push button magazine. So this was early enough that they did the push button magazine. Later, they, they um, made the edict that all the nine millimeters had to be the bottom release. So this is push button, mag release, engraved nine millimeter. Thank you, Peter. I told you I wanted to do this slotted high power. Um, so I'm gonna show you that. And those of you who collect high powers know that the slotted ones are extremely rare because the Belgian army um, ordered these. You're familiar with the high power. The design is very common. The Belgian army um, ordered these for their own military. When the Germans came in and uh, took over the factory in late 1940, uh, they found these in um, various stages of assembly. So this was actually made for the Belgian army. Um, the Nazis came in and they said, we don't need the slot. They did not produce the frames with the slotted backstrap. So the ones that were left in the factory, very few, and these are very rare, and they sell for a lot of money. This is slotted from Belgian army and, and then proofed by the Nazi army. Check this out. You can see that's actually an uh, Eagle 613. And if it looks a little crude to you, that's the way they look. If they're crystal clear and you can see the 613, it's probably fake. Usually the Nazis would also mark it here. You would see it on the, on the uh, slide. In this case, they only marked it here. This was probably completely done in the factory. You do see, look at the front strap, just a gorgeous gun. You do see the serial number here. So this was probably completely done by the Belgians and there's the Belgian proof marks. But then um, when the Nazis, when the German army took over, 
they just did this stamp right here. There are, um, there is an internal stamp. There's actually a, a stamp. I can't show it to you, but right under here on the slide, there is a uh, 613 proof. And then the magazines also um, will be 6-1 proofed right at the, the bottom of the magazine. And again, if, if that Waffen stamp is, is barely readable, if you can read it really well and you can see the wings of the eagle, then it's probably not real. Uh, this is 613 stamped, which is the earliest variation. They next went to an Eagle 103, and then uh, finally they went with the Eagle 140 proof. That was just different inspector stamps, not real important. Uh, this is the tangent site. They also got rid of that a little later, adjustable tangent site. And the slot, of course, I mentioned they got rid of that. Yes, they did make stocks for these, uh, but the stocks are very rare and very hard to find. Now, this came with a holster. It has the uh, spare magazine, and the magazine is 613 proofed. And the holster is Waffen stamped and dated 1941. Um, so that's when, the, uh, when it left the factory, it would have come with a 1941 holster. This is a correct 1941 holster. It actually is a fairly rare holster, probably worth about $500 just for the holster, and the gun is, is worth far more. Uh, this is very, very hard to come by, especially in this kind of condition. Okay, once again, I lied. I'm so sorry, but I just had to show you this. This, uh, you know, some of you already tuned me off, but most of you say, we want more, we want more. Um, I just want to open these up for you. Okay, the blue boxes are post-war boxes and would be correct for these two guns. So these are... Um, two gold engraved. Now this is a PPKS. Um, the PPK was uh, the most popular gun uh, of the Walthers to be imported into the United States, but the U.S. government, in all their wisdom, outlawed the short barrel. Uh, I think it's a four-inch barrel. It had to be a half inch longer. So only for the U.S. market, they made a PPKS, which is just a little bit longer on the barrel a little bit longer on the frame to make it legal to import these into the United States. Uh, these were imported by Interarms. And well, the reason I wanted to show them to you, not only because they're pretty, but check out the serial number. These are consecutively numbered. You know what? I just thought of something. Look at the logos. That's not what I thought of. Never before seen on TV. Let's take a look at the Victor Lutz gun, gold engraved, and the post-war gold engraved um, in terms of quality of engraving. Okay, side-by-side -side comparison, you see the white grip. This one's a little dulled down. You do see the engraving on the uh, safety. It's very similar, actually, with the oak leaf. Probably the clearest oak leaf is right here on the frame, I, and they are remarkably similar. You can see uh, what is probably an oak leaf here and over here. They are remarkably the same, but here's one thing I noticed. Look at the background. It has a stippled, I'm going to say stippled background. You can see how they made it a rough edge here. They tried to do it, but not, it's not done as uh, pronounced. So it has a stippled background. Um, they did a, a, this is a lot, this is a lot less intricate than this. Um, you can see along here, there's a little more room, but this is a lot more intricate. Let's look at the front straps. Well, first of all, that's actually really nice uh, gold, um, gold oak leaf. And this of course says 36 SA marking. So that's not really a fair comparison. Uh, I do notice that the trigger is a little bit of engraving and notice they did they did a partial engraving here and this this one the ejection port is fully engraved they do have the proof mark here unfortunately they did the import mark which i wish they had just uh, engraved over top of that and uh made in germany this is all this is all un non-engraved and here you can see it's partially engraved down to, you can notice the difference under the serial number, the engraving. So uh, the 1936 one has a little bit more intricately engraved. Uh, they both are beautiful guns, but which one would you rather own? 
I can tell you right now, this is the one I'm going with. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you had fun with that. I sure did. And I've got a lot more to show you from uh, the California collection. Uh, so make sure you like and subscribe. Tell some of your friends. Everybody says we should have more subscribers. And I agree completely. So tell your friends about our channel. Maybe forward this to the gun lovers in your life. And thanks for watching.